The space beyond the airlock was even more disorienting to look beyond. The EVA suit was created for short trips outside of the OSS, and like everything on the station, it was constructed in the Seven Cities, and I was essentially trusting it to stay sealed and keep me alive long enough to find the figure beyond the OSS. The suit had enough breathable air for about an hour and a full mobility pack. Similar to a jet pack, but it used compressed carbon dioxide to allow free-range movement in space. I did have to be careful with it because when it was out, it was out, and I would be left to drift in space. Even if I was only a meter away from the OSS, I could still be stuck with no way of reaching it, left to die so close to safety that I would never reach. Still, I had a literal lifeline. A 300 meter long rope and a modified climbing clip, similar to those used by mountain climbers. It would keep the rope from extending, unless I wanted it to extend, and could even be used to pull me back into the airlock. Still, even with that knowledge, a lot of intrusive thoughts bothered me, as I double-checked my lifeline to the OSS. What if a piece of space junk collided with my helmet, cracking it open? What if the rope broke? It was supposed to be rated for almost 2,000 kilograms, but still, things may happen. Still, I quieted these thoughts with a simple statement of fact. Worrying about the problems won't make it easier. Focus on the problem in front of me, and just bring the winged woman back to the OSS. I took my first step out of the OSS and let myself float beyond the relative safety of the station. Even just a few meters beyond the airlock, I could feel cold sweat drip down my forehead. I had to stay calm. I couldn't wipe the sweat out of my eyes. I saw the being drift about five meters beyond the bottom of the OSS, if you thought of the planet as being over me. Using the joystick to allow me to float over to where the woman lay. When I was within reach of her, I gently grabbed her arm and twisted her body, bringing her face to mine. When I saw her face, I almost screamed in my helmet until I realized I wasn't looking at her face. Where her face should have been was instead a mirrored mast. It almost looked like a sun shield used by my helmet, but instead of being golden, it was silver. I saw my own helmet reflected in her mask, and something in my heart told me I didn't want to remove that mask. That must have allowed her to breathe in space, but how did it keep her exposed skin safe from micrometeorites, extreme temperature, and the lack of pressure? She should be dead by now, but even now, I could still see she was breathing, and her fingers and toes were twitching like she was sleeping. I pressed my helmet to where her mask was as I spoke. That way, the sound would carry through my helmet to her mask while I spoke. Hopefully, she was responsive, but this style of communication worked to communicate with other astronauts when we didn't share a communication channel. Who are you? Are you okay? I asked her. I heard her breathing evenly, but no words. She must have been passed out, or even asleep for some reason. So I grabbed her wrist and pulled myself with the automated climbing gear. While we were pulled back, I remembered a story about one of the first men in space, a cosmonaut from Scythia who experienced multiple technical issues and had to pull himself back into his own craft by hand. It was so arduous that he lost about 17 pounds in water weight just from pulling himself back to the capsule in mere minutes, blinded by his own sweat unable to see, barely able to breathe, and no knowledge that he was going to survive. He still made it to the capsule and crashed it back into Earth, where he nearly froze to death while wild animals tried to get into the broken-down capsule. And still, even with all of that, 
he survived, and even now he was living a nice, peaceful life somewhere in the northern forest. Hence the automated climbing clip to pull me back into the OSS. Even if the Seven Cities wanted to pretend that no one else had been to space before, they weren't dumb enough to not prepare an engineering solution for that eventuality. Just outside the airlock began the awkward part of bringing my unexpected guest into the OSS. All six of her limbs had been splayed out and could very easily bang into the edges of the airlock. It was relatively easy to straighten her legs and cross her arms on her chest, like she was asleep, or like she was dead. Her wings were a bigger unknown, though. I didn't know where her bones or joints were in her wings, and I didn't want to break them by mistake. Feeling them with my gloved hands, I tried my best not to feel invasive while doing so. Even when I told myself I was just trying to get her into the OSS, it felt wrong when I felt her wings, like I was invading her privacy. After feeling her wings with my gloves, I was surprised that I couldn't feel any bones at all through the gloves. I could feel the texture of the feathers even through the thick gloves. They were almost metallic, and even running my fingers across them, I didn't ruffle them. I could also feel strong but flexible muscle under the feathers, but the wings moved easily enough without too much resistance. After I checked for bones a second time, I folded her wings around her body like a blanket. She still didn't move or acknowledge what happened as I brought her into the airlock. I closed the external door while I let the airlock fill with atmosphere. And then I opened the internal door and carried the strange being into my living space. I removed my EVA and placed it back where it went, but it was a lot harder to put it away with a passed out floating body in the middle of the room. But with my EVA away, I checked my first aid kit for anything that might be helpful. Sadly, there wasn't a lot there. Some gauze, bandages, and antiseptic wipes. But then again, what can I really check for someone with wings who spent at least 10 minutes in a complete vacuum and appeared to only be passed out? But then I saw next to the first aid kit was my exercise kit. And then I had an idea about how to check to see if she was all right. One of the devices in my exercise kit was a pulse oximeter. In addition to measuring a pulse, it measured the oxygen saturation in my blood while I worked out. Essentially the same device you can buy from any pharmacy or exercise shop down on earth. But here, it would tell me a lot more about my unconscious guest. I carefully unfolded a wing and clicked the oximeter to her index finger. After a few seconds, it beeped, telling me it had her heart rate and oxygen saturation. I lifted the oximeter to my face and read it. Her pulse was a normal resting rate of 54 BPM, a little lower than some people, but not unheard of for athletes to go that low. Her oxygen rate, on the other hand, should not have been possible. It was only 5%. Not 50%. 5%. Brain damage and circulatory arrest could occur when you went as low as 60%. A normal range should be between 90% and 100%. She should be long dead at these levels. And just to test it to make sure it wasn't the oximeter, I put it on my own finger. And sure enough, my heart rate was 84 BPM, and my oxygen saturation was at 98%. So it wasn't the oxometer, and here I was, another impossible thing, just in front of me for me to solve. I almost reached out for her mask when something inside of me screamed not to do that. The same place where I heard the black moon's resonance 
also told me not to remove the angel's mask. But I did remember I had a letter from the Red Prince. I quickly opened it and read it over. The first thing I noticed was the date. It was dated a week ago. How did I miss this letter for a whole week? I read the letter, hoping for an answer. Unfortunately, I got one. Dear Samuel, The news you bring me is quite concerning. Doing some digging, I found out that they're using the Arcana to create paths by creating ritual and using a 30-digit number that is generated randomly. And then using this number like a key, they can open the paths relative to their position on the planet of the world of their choice. Each world gets their own number, and the Empire of the Seven Cities has a path only they can open. From what I heard about, the objects keep the moon, and they're likely just dangerous. And you should not release the moon, whatever you do. The Arcana is tricky, and has the ability to conceal, hide, and also reveal and uncover. They are not illusions, like those made by the Knight of Swords, but they are still dangerous. So always examine what you know, what you think isn't there, and you may see something else. If the Arcana was to get out, then it would be able to go anywhere it wants, and it has no loyalty nor mercy for any human being. And for the Empire of the Seven Cities, spent more time imprisoning the moon than they have spent on the rest of the OSS. They will not hesitate to sacrifice you if they think it will give them the moon. So right away, the smart move is to keep the Arcana steal away, and we will look for our opportunity to bring you back to Earth. If you think there's any pressing information, please feel free to inform me. Sincerely, the Red Prince. I finished reading her letter, glanced at the floating figure in front of me, and with the knowledge that I released the Arcana before I found the letter. Ah, Tavit, I swore to myself as I grabbed the blank piece of paper and the pen as I started to transcribe my letter back to the Red Prince. Dear Red Prince, I regret to inform you that I've already released the Arcana and it teleported itself away. I wasn't able to see your letter until after it was released. Is there anything I can do to keep myself safe? And also, I found someone floating outside the OSS with no spacesuit and no idea how she is alive. But she is. She also has purple wings and some kind of silvery mirror mask. I almost want to say she's an angel, but she doesn't look like any angel that I am familiar with. I also had two odd visitors. A spider-like creature that was made out of humanoid arms and a large mouth. And it had a boss that was floating and wore a metal cowl so I couldn't see its body. But it had red glowing eyes. I want to say they're alien life forms of some kind, but I'm not sure. They were in a spaceship shaped like a stingray with a flag I have never seen before. They didn't notice me because I found a way to hide, but that was definitely unsettling. My console is also still inaccessible. No messages from my liaison, and at this point, I am fairly certain they are leaving me up here to die. I still have my shuttle, which I think can take me back to Earth, but with my guest. And the fact that the moon is gone, I don't know what I should do. But if I sense any danger, I will be evacuating the OSS into Hera 1 and try to ride back to Earth before anything else happens. I sealed the letter and watched it vanish as I drifted over to my console to see if I could turn it on or get some kind of information from the computer. But still, it was off and nothing I did turned it back on. But as I checked over the dials, I noticed that the oxygen level was starting to dip below normal when I heard movement behind me. I rolled around to see the figure was now moving. She unwrapped her wings from around her body and was moving around in a quick panic. First, she lifted her hands to her mask, but after she confirmed that it was still there, 
She calmed down a little bit, but still got as far away from me as possible in the tiny space. And then she slowly turned to face me. Her wings were draped like a cape behind her, and I could see my own terrified face reflected in her mask as she stared at me. After staring at each other in silence for nearly five minutes, she finally spoke to me. What she said, I couldn't understand. It didn't resemble any language that I knew. The only word I could pick up on was LCL, and that was because she said it many times. Maybe LCL was what she was looking for? I shook my head and lifted my empty arms up to indicate that I didn't understand her. She let out an audible sigh and tried a different language. This one I recognized as Latin. Even if I only understood some words and my grammar was terrible, but I figured I could try to respond to her questions. Ubi some? She asked me. She asked where she was. Uh, Supa Taram, I told her, that she was above the earth. Quomodo ad el ciel. How do I get to el ciel? She asked me. Again, I shook my head, feeling tired of not having any answers for anyone, not even myself. Quid est el ciel? I asked her what el ciel is. And she responded with one word, asa, her home. After that response, there was only more silence until I decided to break it by offering her my name. Samuel, I said, pointing at myself. The angel nodded and pointed at herself. Sariel, Sariel told me. Something about her name caused the thing inside of me to shift. At first, I thought it was fear, but then I realized it was familiarity. The resonance that still lived inside of me recognized Sariel, even if I didn't. So, with that in mind, I figured it would be best to let the resonance speak. Once again, I relaxed and let it slither up my throat, and the resonance spoke in my voice. The language wasn't one I understood, and it felt like the words echoed in the OSS, and they echoed back with different words and different meanings. Sariel turned her head, and even though I couldn't see her face through her mask, I thought she must have been confused by what was happening. Sariel responded in the same echoing language that made my head hurt and my thoughts feel smoky as I let my mind drift and let the resonance speak for me. While I let my thoughts drift away, I wondered about what was living inside of me now. It spoke for me and it advised me and it seemed to know more about what was going on than I did. Every time I let it speak, I felt more and more powerful, but it also felt like it was taking up more and more space inside of me. The conversation between Sariel and the resonance became heated as Sariel began to gesticulate as she spoke, and I became dimly aware that she was approaching my body. Her wings unfolded behind her, but this time, instead of only two wings, she had six somehow, and they were stretched out almost ten meters each, which is odd because the OSS wasn't big enough for her to fully stretch out her wings. I was also vaguely aware of black smoke that began to fill the OSS. Still, I didn't feel threatened. I just relaxed and let the resonance speak for me, confident that the sound would keep me safe. Sariel's wings went through another change. In any other situation, watching as every single feather 
opened up, revealing hundreds or even thousands of eyes, both red and blue, all focusing on me with the precision of a predator, would have been unsettling. But here, it wasn't. I watched as her hair behind her head moved like many venomous snakes, waiting to bite at her prey. And her mask reflected my floating face. In her mirror mask, I could see that my eyes were glazed over. My slack-jawed mouth was open, with black smoke slithering out of my mouth. A snake of smoke that left my mouth with the resonance was beginning to curl around my legs. The head rose higher and higher as it constricted more and more of my body. Before I knew what was happening, Sariel flew across the OSS and slammed my mouth shut. That broke me out of my trance. My mouth now shut, my eyes focused, and I could see my own terrified expression in Sariel's mask and I realized just how tight my legs and chest were being constricted by the smoke. As it dissipated and I stared at my reflection in Sariel's mask, and even though I couldn't see her face, by how much her hands shook as she held my jaw, she was either angry or terrified of me, or possibly both. Legion, she spat at me. Her tone was full of venom as the smoke finally dissipated. She let go of my mouth finally, and when I opened my mouth to ask what happened, she struck my mouth again, covering it with her mouth. Her expressionless mask conveyed an almost murderous intent as she stared me down through it. Lee Jin, she repeated herself like it was the most important thing in the world. After two minutes, she let go of my mouth, and this time, I stayed silent. Once again, my most important skill, and the one that guaranteed I didn't get any answers. Once again. Sariel took a relaxed breath, and the many eyes on her wings closed before her wings folded into themselves and went from six back into two that she folded behind her back. Sariel stared me down before she turned to the airlock and left the OSS. I drifted to the airlock window and watched as Sariel opened the external door and stared down at the planet below. In the vacuum of space, she moved with no difficulty and breathed as I saw her chest rise and fall, even though there was no air. I watched as she braced against the edge of the OSS and pushed off, aiming herself towards the earth below. I drifted over to the window inside the OSS proper that allowed me to look down at the earth. And I watched as Sariel fell towards the earth. Her wings splayed out behind her while she fell into the atmosphere, igniting as she fell to the earth, a burning phoenix, while I watched her disappear into the earth beyond my view. Nope. I'm done. I'm leaving this crazy place, I said, as I glanced at the oxygen levels in the OSS again. They were still dropping, and if I was reading it correctly, I would start experiencing hypoxia within a few minutes, if I didn't leave. Taking slow breaths, I quickly put on the EVA suit and went over the emergency landing procedures in my head. Back on Earth, there were procedures to follow. I would inform ground control via radio, and they would offer guidance while I would take the best vectors to get Hera-1 back to Earth. But here, I was told not to return too early, and the radio was still non-functional. I only had myself to rely on. My EVA suit on, and now my own oxygen supply. I still watched the oxygen dial drop. Even without me 
breathing in the OSS, something else was burning the oxygen. But I couldn't stay here, even if I wanted to. Solving that mystery would take too much time. My suit's air supply wouldn't last long either, just over an hour. Every piece built by the Seven Cities, I reminded myself as I went to the airlock that had the shuttle. I heard that every other nation had EVAs that could last 16 hours with oxygen. My EVA would have a little over an hour. I entered the shuttle and went through all my procedures to disembark from the OSS. It didn't take too long, but I still felt a cold sweat while I went through all of my checks. Even on the shuttle, my radio to ground control was off and wouldn't turn on. But at least I was able to let go of the OSS and let the Hera 1 drift into her first vector. The process of bringing the shuttle back to Earth from the OSS safely would take three hours. But ironically, even if the shuttle came directly back to Earth in a crash landing, it wouldn't be that much faster. It would take me two hours to fall to Earth. As I hit my first vector and the Hera 1 made its way back to Earth, I checked my oxygen reserves on the Hera 1 when I realized that the shuttle had almost no oxygen. Only 5% of the atmosphere was oxygen and 10% of it was carbon dioxide, and the other 85% was nitrogen. The air in the Hera 1 was completely unbreathable to me. I checked my oxygen timer on my EVA suit. I had an hour and five minutes left of breathable air in my suit. Even as I focused my efforts on hitting my next vectors, the horror dawned on me about what happened. They never intended for me to come back. I was supposed to die on the OSS. That's why the Hera 1 didn't have breathable air, and why my EVA didn't have enough air for the trip. Even if I left the OSS in the shuttle, I was never going to return. I would suffocate in silence with no way to reach Earth long before I got to breathable air, and the shuttle would crash into the Earth with no one to know what happened. My entire life, my legacy, my love for my empire, a flaming crater in the Earth with no one to miss me. Well, except maybe my brother. With that thought, I took slow, calm breaths as I continued to hit my vectors. The only thing that panic would do is burn up my oxygen quicker. If I stayed calm, I would last longer, and maybe I would find a way back to Earth safely, like Sariel did. As time passed on and I hit more vectors, I thought about the regrets in my life. I thought about the love of my life and how I broke her heart after we graduated high school. I was on a fast track to be a pilot. She was going to take a gap year working as a club hostess. My father told me to forget her because where she was going to work, she was going to be stuck there forever. But I was supposed to be a hero to the Seven Cities. My mother told me to give up this career for her and to wait for her that I may never find love again if I let this girl go. I followed my father's advice, and they divorced soon after that argument. And as much as I want to blame myself, realistically, it was a million other things. I was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Neither of them asked me what I wanted to do, and I used my most important skill of staying silent about my wants, so they both figured they knew what I wanted. I wanted her to come with me, and to this day I wondered if she ever would have said yes, 
but I remained silent and everyone else decided they knew what I wanted to do. A warning alarm went off in my helmet. Only 30 minutes of breathable air left in my suit. I turned off the alarm, but the red light on my arm still blinked. But now the alarm was muted, at least for now. But still, it was distracting to notice that the cockpit of the Hera 1 looked like it was full of blood, as I thought back to our last family dinner. Before I graduated from the pilot program, everyone met for dinner. Even after the divorce, both my mom and dad insisted on trying to be a family. There was a fight between Ethan and both my parents. I don't remember what it was that started it, but I still remember that rare time where both my mother and father agreed. They called Ethan trash for working as a barista. They told him that he was the failure of the family, not them. My mother said that he was dead to her, and my father told Ethan to get out of the house and never come back. That it would be better for the family if he never came back. And as far as he was concerned, Ethan was never a part of the family. At that time, I remember... Ethan's eyes full of tears and his mouth full of sobs as he looked to his siblings to defend him. My sister only flipped him off and I was, of course, silent. It didn't matter that I didn't agree with my mother nor my father. I had to remain silent, otherwise their anger would be turned towards me instead of Ethan. So, naturally, everyone at the table assumed I agreed with Ethan, and he left the house. I haven't seen him since. But it still didn't take long for my mother and father to turn their anger towards me. That very night, my mother told me that I was dead to her for not taking my shot at love. My father, about a week later left me a long, angry voicemail explaining how I never supported him, nor his choices, so he was going to live in Scythia, where his lifestyle was encouraged. The last I heard from him was nine months later, as he left an even longer, even angrier, rambling message about how he was stuck fighting horses to get his next drink. Naturally, I was quiet the entire time. I never let them know what I was feeling, and after a while, even I wasn't sure what I felt. Long after those incidents, I just stayed focused on my work. It was easier to not think of myself as a person with feelings and needs. I was just a pilot, serving my emperor. I did a good job, and I moved on to the next one when it was complete. It was almost like I was in a perpetual daze, as I did my job and went back home. This was my way. Something in me told me that there was a reward at the end of the rainbow for all of my hard work. But I didn't even know what I was working towards at the end of everything. Love? Money? accomplishment, glory. No matter what I did, I didn't know what I was seeking out. But I figured if I just did the hard work and did as I was told, then there was going to be a reward. But now, as I stare at my 15-minute warning of oxygen, and I hit yet another vector as I descended to Earth, I realize that this was the end of my rainbow. I was the one who volunteered for every big project. Because I was silent about my complaints and needs, so clearly I didn't have any, or at least that's what everyone thought, including myself. I was someone who did the impossible task without saying it was impossible. 
The Empire of the Seven Cities didn't see me as someone loyal to the Emperor and worth rewarding. I was just another tool worth using and then throwing away. I felt tears fill my eyes as my suit gave my final low oxygen warning. No minutes left, just a persistent beeping I couldn't turn off, and the red light bathed the cockpit. My head ached in the same rhythm as the beeping. As the edges of my vision blurred and turned dark, and I found myself hyperventilating, even if I wasn't trying to. I hit another vector as a thought occurred in my slow brain. This was where I was going to die, and there was nothing I could do about it. I was too far away and there was no air to breathe, but luckily there would be no pain. I would just let myself fall to sleep, and then never wake up. I wouldn't be aware of the crash, and I would suffocate long before I ever reached the ground. I felt myself slip into the darkness. There, I was warm. I was safe. Soon to leave this world for the sunless lands. All I would ever have to do is let myself fall deeper into sleep. It did feel comforting, but something inside of me wanted to fight. It wasn't the resonance. It wasn't anything I was familiar with. But at the same time, it was something that I knew about my entire life. Death was pulling me into the darkness... And even then, something in me wanted to keep living. Everything in the universe was telling me that it was impossible to keep going. Everything was stacked against me. All I had to do was nothing. Remain silent one last time, and I would be free of every problem and every pain in life and everything else in life itself. But now, I was refusing to remain silent. If suffocation told me I was going to die, that this was it, and I would break, then I would respond to suffocation with one simple word. No. I will not break. Not now, not ever. Not anymore. What happened next was like I was facing an ocean trying to wash me away while I stood on the beach. But I stood firm. Even as the ocean swallowed me and all that I stood on, I stood strong and told the ocean no. I was going to stay. And the ocean? It obeyed. I woke up with full focus and strength as I hit my last vector. I must have pa been passed out for a while, because I was really off course with less than a kilometer away from the ground below, as I aimed Hera 1 the best I could to reduce the crash. It wasn't a lot of time, but I did show slow the shuttle down some before impact with the sand below. The metal around me crumbled like paper, and it was the most horrendous noise I had heard in my life as I was flung forward through the front of the shuttle, tearing through both glass and metal and into the dune directly in front of me. And even though I lifted my arms up to try to protect myself, I didn't feel any pain or any discomfort. After being stunned for a few moments, I stood up and trudged up the dune to examine the wreck. And sure enough, when I made it up to the top of the dune, I saw that below me was a massive crater of fused glass, steel, and flame. I survived that crash when I really shouldn't have. 
I checked my gloved hands, and as far as I could see, the suit wasn't even scuffed, let alone torn up. I had no broken bones, no bruises, and no discomfort of any kind. This definitely shouldn't be possible. I decided to examine myself as I tried to unclasp my helmet to examine in myself, but the clasp wouldn't open. After a few failed attempts, I decided to try my gloves. Those clasps wouldn't work either. I couldn't even get them to budge a little bit. After a few more failed attempts, I decided to leave them be. I wasn't uncomfortable, at least until I realized something else. My breath wasn't fogging up the glass in front of my face. In fact, I couldn't hear my breath at all. I tried panting and screaming, but that didn't do anything. What is this? I asked. And I could hear my voice, but as a scratchy electronic noise that came from outside my suit, not within it. Whatever happened to my body? It was almost like... I wasn't in my suit anymore. This dark thought didn't bother me like I thought it would. I had done the impossible once again, but this time for myself. I would have a second chance at a good life, and all I had to do was try and find the Red Prince. She was somewhere in River City, right? I glanced around the desert, and I saw a freeway a few kilometers away. I started to trudge towards the freeway while I let my feet carry me there. Whatever happened in space and in that crash, I left Samuel Stevens' Lastaname in that wreck. And now I, Star Sailor, Legion of the Black Moon, trekked to find that mysterious detective, the Red Prince.